Hey kids, welcome back. Glad to uh, be able to touch bases with you again on reading what from one of my favorite books anyway is The Chaplains of and Clergy of the American Revolution. Uh, and uh, boy, I'll tell you what, we're just continuing to go through these great ministers who uh, we need more of in modern times. So I just wanted to follow up from a radio program that I did that the potentials of what has happened in modern times is that you may not be always getting the great spiritual leading that you need. But uh, I pray that you do, and I pray that your parents are continuing to work with you on it, and uh, I know that uh, God will be gracious to you. So let's continue on with chapter 35, and none other than this um, Mr. Benjamin Pomeroy. His early life he becomes a new light, is persecuted by the state, and finally deprived of his salary, becomes chaplain in the French War. His letter to his wife describing the execution of a criminal. At 70, becomes chaplain in the Revolutionary Army. His venerable appearance, touching appeals, and his death. Now, that's amazing is that at 70, he continues. He doesn't go off into retirement, but he continues to uh, live out his calling both for God and his country. So as we continue in this book, a few of the New England clergy who deserved as chaplains in the... A few of the New England clergy who served as chaplains in the French War lived to act in the same capacity in the revolutionary struggle. Among these was Benjamin Pomeroy, who was born in Suffield, Connecticut in 1704. Having graduated at Yale College in 1733 with the highest honors of his class, he devoted a short time to the study of theology and two years after was ordained pastor of the church in Hebron, Connecticut. Having identified himself with the great religious excitement which commenced about 1740, he was called a new light, and as such became obnoxious to the bigoted, intolerant act of 1742, passed by the state to prevent, it was said, the great disorders caused by these revivalists. Being arraigned before the assembly, he was tried and acquitted, though he narrowly escaped personal violence at the hands of the excited crowd who had assembled to witness the trial. Two years after, he was brought again before the assembly for having denounced its intolerant edicts, especially for saying on fast day that, quote, great men had fallen in with those who were on the devil's side and enemies to the kingdom of Christ, that they had raised such persecutions in the land that if there be a faithful minister of the Lord Jesus, he must lose his estate, that if there be a faithful man in civil authority, he must lose his honor and usefulness, and that there was no colony so bad as Connecticut for persecuting laws, end quote. For this bold declaration, he was condemned to pay the cost of the prosecution, give bonds to the amount of 50 pounds for his peaceable behavior till the succeeding May, and then appear again before the assembly to make up his bond. This surveillance of the state caused him much annoyance, but he retained the confidence and the love of his entire parish. Subsequently, he was again arraigned and suffered still severe punishment. A lecture, having been advertised for him in the adjoining town of Closchester, with the consent, as he supposed, of the pastor, he went at the appointed time, to the church where it was to be delivered, but found it closed against him. Finding a crowd, however, assembled to hear him, 
he willing, unwillingly, he was unwillingly to disappoint them. So he was unwilling to disappoint them. And so adjourned to a neighboring grove and gave his lecture. For this violation of the law, he was deprived of his stated salary for a period of seven years. On breaking out of the French war, he became a chaplain in the army. Whether the annoyance to which he was subjected by the oppressive laws of the state or his own ardent spirit prompted him to this course, we are unable to say. We are left in equal ignorance of the incidents that marked his career during the campaigns in the wilderness. A single waif has drifted down to posterity in the shape of a letter to his wife, which gives us a glimpse of his life as chaplain. And this was up in Lake George, July 23, 1759. My dear, Saturday last, at break of day, our troops, to the number of 12,000, embarked for Cabrillon, all in health and high spirits. I could wish for more dependence on God than was observable among them, yet I hope God will grant deliverance unto Israel by them. Mr. Beebe and I, by the advice of our colonel, stay behind, but expect soon to follow. A considerable number of sick are left here in the hospitals. Five died last night. I have been well in general. Want very much to hear from you, our dear children, the people, the neighboring ministers, etc. I would mention, did time permit me to describe it, the affecting scene of last Friday morning? A poor, wretched criminal, Thomas Bailey, was executed. Mr. Brainerd and myself chiefly discoursed with him, but almost all his care was to have his life prolonged. He pleaded with us to intercede with the general for him, but there was no prospect of succeeding. His crime was stealing or robbing, whereof he had frequently been guilty, once received 100 lashes, and once reprieved from the gallows. But being often reproved, he hardened his heart, and was suddenly destroyed. Several prayers were made at the place of execution. The poor creature was terrified, even to amazement and distraction, at the approach of the king's terror. An eternity of sinful pleasure would be dear bought with the pains of the last two hours of his life. He struggled with his executioners, I believe, more than an hour ere they could put him in any proper position to receive the shot. The captain of the guard told me since that he verily believed that the devil helped him. I was far from thinking so, yet his resistance was very extraordinary. I am, with increasing love and affection, my dear, your most affectionate, loving husband, Benjamin Pomeroy. Now, as a man of his fearless, independent nature, and who had suffered from oppressive laws, would not likely be a mere spectator of the struggle of the colonists against the tyrannical acts of Britain. Though his ardent and impetuousness spirit had become somewhat tempered by age, he entered into the quarrel with all the energy and enthusiasm of youth. His impassioned eloquence and impressive appeal that were so wont to move his audience in the time of Whitfield, were now devoted to a cause equally worthy of his fervent sympathy and great powers. Preaching extempore, those addresses which would melt his hearers to tears have never come down to posterity. He had reached his threescore and ten years, and as he stood before his audience and spoke of the coming struggle and declared that God would make bare his right arm for the deliverance of his people and the discomfiture of his foes and foretold the coming glory of the nation free and independent, he seemed some ancient seer whose aged eyes pierced the clouds that wrapped the future from the gaze of ordinary mortals. 
When the news of the battles of Lexington and Concord reached Hebron, though he was 71 years of age, it stirred the sluggish blood in his aged veins so that he hastened to the army and volunteered his services as chaplain. The venerable divine, with his thin locks white as the driven snow, was looked upon almost with veneration by the soldiers. His addresses to them were mostly earnest appeals to fight manfully the battles of freedom, assuring them that the cause was God's and that ultimate victory was as certain as that God's promise could not be broken. It was an affecting sight to see that prophet in Israel standing on the tented field, surrounded by young soldiers, urging them as Ephraim Malbar of old did the covenanters to let, quote, every man's hand be like the hand of Samson and every sword like that of Gideon that turned not back from the slaughter, end quote. He was too infirm to follow the army in its long and toilsome campaigns, and after a while returned to his people. The war passed on in its vicissitudes, but in that gloomiest hour, when hope could scarcely see a single gleam of light through all the enclosing darkness, his faith never shook, and he spoke as confidently then as amid the exultation of a great victory that God would deliver his people. He lived to see this prediction verified and sat like a patriarch of old and listened with tearful eyes and overflowing heart to the shouts of joy that rolled over the ransomed land. He died December 22, 1784, at the 81st year of his age. It's always important to know, kids, that as we consider what it means to be faithful to the Lord, faithful servants, but also faithful to the causes of liberty, these men were that, and Benjamin Pomeroy was very clear on that from all that he stood up against when it came to stopping him from preaching, taking on all of those various issues, as well as then even at the age of 71, ready to run out and be there to help the army with anything he could do. Well, we're going to go ahead and look into the next chapter as we get here, and that's going to be chapter 36 about John Rogers. So I look forward to being able to talk to you kids again and hope that each one of these is something that you will cherish and that will help you understand that liberty is from Christ, and then we have to fight for it and protect it from all evil. Talk to you soon.